Interactions with News and Opinion Makers, organized by the Indian Express Group. Today at EADA, our guest is Nandan Nilekani, non-executive chairman and co-founder of Infosys, who also led India's ambitious Aadhaar project. He is in fact, uh, he has in fact led projects in the private as well as the public sector and has the rare advantage of being able to understand the impact of technology from both perspectives. He's just out with a new book, The Art of Bitfulness, which we'll hear more about during this session, where Mr. Nilekani will be in conversation with Anand Goenka, uh, Executive Director, the Indian Express Group, and uh, P. Vedanathan Ayer, Executive Editor, the Indian Express. Before beginning the session, I would like to thank our presenting partner, Ferolex Pipes, our associate partners, MDH, EO Mumbai, TheHinduZone.com, and MIDC. And I'd also like to thank our live webcast partner, 24 Frames Digital. Uh, viewers, if you have any questions, please put them in the Zoom chat box and we will try answering as many as we can. I will now hand this over to Anand and Vedi. Thank you, Pooja. Ladies and gentlemen, very warm welcome to another e -Adda. And, you know, we are hoping to get back to, to physical very soon. Every time we start doing that and something happens, then we kind of can't do it. But, but we are very excited. Uh, we are all here to hear from uh, Nandan Nelekani, who we all know really well. I won't, uh, I won't introduce him or say anything about him, that, uh, that you, you know everything about him anyway. Um, but I don't know how many of you all know about his latest book, The Art of Bitfulness. And, you know, it's really something, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I was surprised uh, with how much I enjoyed it. I just kept reading, you know, I, I finished it quite fast. Um, you know, and to those of you who still visit bookstores, um, you know, you may go looking for this book, uh, given who the authors are in the technology section. Uh, but I think you're more likely to find the book in the self-help section because, you know, it's full of sentences like, uh, and I'm quoting, as with all toxic relationships, you don't focus on the people, you focus on the patterns. Uh, so... So, Nandan, I mean, I've, I've found many such sentences, but I just thought, you know, you wouldn't see a sentence like this in, in, in a book authored by you. I, I wouldn't expect, but um, so, so where does this book go? Does it go in, uh, in self-help or, or in technology? It's all about, you know, I would call it as how, how do we make our lives better? It's, I know, self, but it's also there's a lot of policy stuff too in the book. We, we, in the third part of the book, we talk about how to address this. But you know, this book, which is co-authored by my young colleague, Tanuj Bojwani, uh, who, as I mentioned earlier, is a left brain, right brain, IIT and who does liberal arts. Uh, we, this book is really a book that came out of the pandemic, uh, Anant. I think during the pandemic, I think all of us experienced much more digital intensity in our lives. We, you know, we were sitting in our offices, homes, doing calls over Zoom or some Google, Google or Microsoft Teams. We were... Uh, you know, ordering food on the, on our apps, we were uh, buying things on e-commerce. So the whole thing had just become much more digital. And we realized that, you know, people are getting into these devices and many of these devices are about, you know, many of the applications are about getting your attention. And we, we you know, we are big believers in technology. So let me get this straight. I am a big believer in technology for transformation. And that's been my sort of mission, both... Yeah in the private sector at Infosys, as well as in the public sector for the work I've done. Yes. But, you know, this kind of technology where people are just taking away all their attention, I think, uh, needs people to have some good, what we call as digital hygiene. Yes. How do we use devices in a better way? We can't throw away devices. We can't, you know, we can't say we'll use some supreme willpower. That's not going to work. But is there a more simpler, pragmatic way of doing it? So it's really, it's not a, it's not an anti-tech book at all. It's a pro you book. Yes. How do you become a master of your digital technology? Sure. I, I'm, I'm just going to take the time uh, to just read one very striking paragraph. It's actually the opening paragraph of the second chapter. I'll just spend a few seconds reading it. Um, it says a December 2020 survey of 2000 Indian urban smartphone users revealed that on average users spend 6.9 hours on their smartphones every day. I, I found this quite startling. About 74% said that they get moody and irritable when they stop using their mobile phones, while 73% while said they feel compelled to check their smartphones continually. 84% people check their phones within the first 15 minutes of waking up, and 46% respondents said they pick up the phone at least five times in an hour-long conversation meeting with friends. Uh, 
and the same report uh, says that 70% agreed that if their usage continues at the current rate or grows, it is likely to impact their mental health, uh, their mental or physical health. 74% of respondents agreed that it's vital for them to have a life separate from their mobile phones. And 73% agreed that they would be happier if they spent less time on their smartphones. So I've just given you a bunch of data, but it was all packed in one paragraph. I thought it was a nice, nice to present the problem as a, how big the problem is. And then your first two books, uh, you know, you were very, I'm just kind of drawing a metaphor here. I think your first two books, you were kind of evangelizing digital and, and, and trying to, you know, uh, talk about how there can be an equitable distribution of, the, of, of digital for India. Uh, if I could just draw a metaphor, are we kind of saying that your first two books were, were talking about uh, evangelizing cakes to, uh, to, to starving people? Uh, and your third book is t is telling them how to eat the cake without becoming obese or 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 or, or diabetic. It, it, am I kind of right? In, in oh, that that look, look. As I said, I'm I'm a huge believer in technology for transformation, technology for good. Uh, you know, the work that I've done both in the public and private sector is actually about how do we impact the lives of millions and and, and make it better through technology. But I think the the thing is that the the thing that led us to do this book is that. The newer thing are doing, you know, sitting at the, you know, getting some fake news and getting angry about something or the other, or watching some 15 second video or something. That's, that's, that you have to be careful because those are fundamentally designed to keep you engaged all the time because the, the model of business is keeping you engaged. And that's where I think we should take the good things of technology, which I'm a big believer in. But be also prudent about how we use it and also, you know, a lot of people feel that they're using all this so they are weak and they need to exercise willpower. It's not about that. It's about having systems about how to do things in a better way. So it's not about, it's, it's about using technology in a better way. It's about being calm. It's about getting productivity from calmness. And that's what we're trying to address in the book, Anand. Yeah. You know, there's a graph here I want to show everybody. It says that three hours of screen time actually translates to seven hours of distracted effort. It's a beautiful kind of lots of litter like that. So, uh, Nandan, in this, in the, in the, in the, you know, always going on debate of, you know, of, of uh, humanity versus technology. As of now, are we seeing that technology is winning? No, I, I, I think technology has become very, very pervasive, and the pandemic has only accelerated that because now. Whether it is, you know, this call we're doing e adda, which was always a physical thing till we had to go digital has become e adda. So that digital, we order food digitally, we buy things digitally, we have relationships digitally, we have, uh, you know, our grandmothers talk to their grandchildren digitally. So, I mean, the last two years has dramatically accelerated the, the digital role in our lives. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talk of this as a third crisis because, you know, we, we, you know, the first crisis, you know, the pandemic was one crisis where we had, a, you know, virus that went you know exponential and we all had to lock down yeah. and then we have the climate crisis where you know over the next few years we better get our act together on carbon otherwise we'll have heating it in the planet which will put us you know out of filter yeah. so this is the third one how do we in this increasingly digital world how do we be on top of things don't let the technology overwhelm you but you be on top of technology use it for your own benefit get Get all the value of the fantastic things that are out there, but don't don't succumb to it and then you know become miserable or feel what am I doing and so on. Yeah, you know you uh, one of the interesting pieces again in the book was on uh, you know you have a chapter called a bitful lens to social media. Um, can I just ask you to walk us through you know your recipe of using social media specifically? Uh, Actually, I don't use uh, social media. Uh, let me tell you what I do. Yes. Uh, I have a very simple protocol. I have three devices for the three modes in which I act on work on a computer. So we, we define three modes. There's a create mode, which is where you work and you need to be very focused and you don't want distractions. There's a curate mode where you read or watch or you know just browse and so on. And there's a communicate mode, which is where you talk to people through various channels. So my model is very simple. I have a laptop for my create mode. So whenever I have to work, I work on my laptop at my desk with the right lighting. So when I go and sit down there, 
I, already my mental frame is uh, to work. And I'll give you the physical example. When you go and go to a bar, you go to meet people, socialize, have a drink. When you go to the library, you want it to be quiet where you can work and read. Right. And when you go to the uh, to the park for a run, you want to breathe fresh air and hear the uh, hear the birds. So in the physical world, we associate these things. So we think that you need something similar in the digital world. So I have this laptop where I do all my work. I have an iPad on which I do all my reading and curation and watching things. And I use the phone only for communication. And again, I only use uh, voice and SMS. I don't use any other uh, social media. I do use Twitter, but I use Twitter in a broadcast mode. When I want to send out a message, I don't get into you know discussions on Twitter. So I have a very simplified model of engaging with technology, which may sound old fashioned to some people. And the good thing is there are no notifications coming all the time. There's nothing, you know, interrupt me, interrupting me, which allows me to be much more thoughtful or do things I want to do. Uh, Vaidhi, I get just one last question. I, I know I've not, uh, just one last question. I do, uh, then we get Vaidhi in also, but you know, Nandan, the point is that, you know, you're Nandan Nilekani. I mean, uh, you know, for people, I mean, for other people, for, for, for for mere mortals like us, you know, we have a problem that we might miss out on something if we don't, I mean, I would love not to have WhatsApp, but honestly, you know, I, I can't, I, I, I don't have the luxury, I think of not having WhatsApp because, you know, whatever, my, 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 com my, my competitor might respond quicker if I was a salesperson or, you know, in whatever field I am. Uh, it's just like the world has moved to a place where, especially post COVID, there really aren't any lines. Uh, and if you're not fully there and you're not... Yeah, sure. general, then... No, no. In fact, I agree with you. I mean, uh, but you know, I don't think it's uh, like Tanoj, he's a big WhatsApp guy. So it's not that uh, just my style and I'm explaining. But important, he also draws the line. You know, when, for he, when he's, for example, when he's sitting down to work on his computer, he has a profile called uh, Tan Create Tanoj Profile or something. And that's when he's say, writing, writing something, you know. Right. In that profile, he has set it up that there is no other social media on that profile and there are no, no notifications coming. So when he enters that profile, he is very focused on his work. Whereas he has other profiles and he has profiles of his close friends. He has profiles of his larger you know, group. You know, so you use software to create different uh, sort of pre presence on the system. Right. The thing is that if you have one device and you have some 10 apps open and they're all sending you notifications all the time, then that is, that's, that's a recipe for not having, being able to focus. And as you show that graph, when we keep shifting from, you know, writing an email to seeing some notification, to seeing some headline, to seeing some forward, you're all over the place. The, the brain can't deal with it. And each time you switch, you again have to re, you know, reposition your mind. And that's very expensive to do. Yeah. Biting? Yeah. Uh, hi, Nandan. As I said, you know, the, the book was unputdownable for me, especially because, because, you know, the way humanity is like the subjects of sociology, philosophy or psychology, how they kind of uh, go a long way in explaining technology and, you know, its impact or probably, you know, the way we ceded control to, say, uh, many of these big tech uh, other firms. You know, think very quickly, uh, Nandan, you know, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter uh, on one side and say a Google or a Amazon, uh, some of them instant gratification, some, some of them for search, some of them for buying stuff, all kind of in some way uh, make your life more meaningful. Uh, but then, we, of course, as if you point out uh, in your book that, you know, you give a slice of your life, you give your emotions, you give your preferences, you give your likes and dislikes, all such information out there uh, to these companies. And of course, all of these are monetized. So that was probably what was the second wave, uh, the digital crisis leading up to the digital crisis. So in this third wave, what do you expect in the digital crisis? And can you shape it? Uh, when you say third wave, what do you mean, Maidi? Like, you know, the post post this, you know, entire sharing of information. So how, yeah, sure. we yeah. are in, in that digital crisis mode now. So how do you yeah. shape that? Yeah, first of all, I think all these are amazing companies and have created tremendous value for all of us. Frankly, we, in the pandemic, we would not have been able to survive yeah. with these great companies. Uh, I think the challenge has been that because of the attention economy where advertising is a big part of it, 
your attention has been taken away and you have to be careful about that. I think going forward, I think uh, there are two models that are emerging. One is, of course, the crypto world or decentralized world or what's going under the name of Web 3.0, where essentially the crypto guys say that you, 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 you know, you can, you have, you are complete uh, control over your data and you have complete portability and all that on the blockchain. So that's one. And there are strengths and weaknesses with that approach. And the second approach is what in India we call as digital public goods. How do you create uh, digital uh, platforms and templates that allow people to interoperate and uh, uh, use technology well? And we have many examples of course, Aadhaar has 1.3 billion people and they're able to, they're doing 50 million authentications a day. They are able to check and in the, in the pandemic, they could just do the ID checking online without having to go anywhere. UPI has gone from 100,000 transactions a month in October of 2016 to 4.5 billion transactions uh, last month. And today a vegetable vendor can make a 10 rupee transaction using UPI. So that's an amazing thing that we have democratized payments. Uh, the account aggregator framework is democratizing data. So India is has creating a new model of the internet, which I think is much more inclusive which allows everyone to participate and they participate in an interoperable world. For example, in UPI, you can use any app, you can use any application you want. You can use phone pay, Paytm, Google pay, WhatsApp pay, whatever you want. Similarly, you can have your bank account in any bank. So that kind of flexibility is what people are asking for. And the digital public goods in India with these open protocols is creating that flexibility. So that's another way of to think about it, you know. So that probably the you know, one is to think of it as a crypto kind of approach. The other is the Indian digital public goods approach. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then you know, it is of course, you no know, transformative power of the United uh, uh, Payment Interface. Uh, you have also talked about an Indian stack, uh, you know, extending up to you know health, education, and other areas. No, all this information that one is sharing in uh, with say be it companies, uh, be it global big techs, uh, or even I, uh, Indian uh, internet companies, all this is happening at a time when you know we don't have uh, yet have a data protection uh, or a data privacy law. Uh, so what is at stake? Do you think that you know have we gone too far sharing all this information without a law being that? Do you think? There are certain things at stake today. Well, well, obviously, I think a law would be good, and I know that the law is in Parliament now, and I assume that it's being looked at. But I think it's also up to us, uh, and that's the point in our book that you know it's one thing is about the law, but it's also about us. For example, if you you can create multiple profiles of yourself, and you can use different profiles for different activities, because finally, the uh, you know. Privacy is boundary management. How do you make sure that you define the boundaries? And if you create, what happens is that, you know, we'll have one account on say Instagram mm -hmm. and everybody is following me on that one account, whether it's my family members, whether it's my professional colleagues, whether it's my advisors, whether it's my parents, whatever. That's when it all gets cluttered up. And therefore people who want to create boundaries, create different profiles, which they share with different people. So they'll have one profile, he has only got 10 of their closest friends and on that profile they'll share the most intimate details because they know they are trusted friends. There may be another profile of business acquaintances where I'll share different kinds of things. I'll have a third profile which is open which allows anyone to come in. So I think we have to think of that. That's the whole part of our book that you have to use all this technology to create systems of how you work or how you present yourself and that's really what we have to do because we can't wait for other things to happen. Right? I mean, you can say the law will come and all, but how do we take agency over these things and create approaches? That's what we're trying to address, Tanuj and I. Yeah, Nandan, you know, going just a step forward, like, you know, of course, uh, this digital crisis, the, th the third crisis that you talked about, you know, besides, say, climate and pandemics, uh, it also leads to a kind of huge imbalance in the society. Can you just say uh, imbalance of power in the society can you would you want to elaborate on that and further uh, is it just that i being mindful or bitfulness that you talk about or is it the government or is it uh, the private and uh, private sector enterprise in collaboration with the government that can bring about more sustainability here well i think obviously one part of it and the 
part of our book which is in the middle part is about how i can take charge of my life how i can use technology better how can i use my time better how do i create systems and profiles to do different things at different times so that's that's entirely within the person's ability and we have a lot of stuff on that that's probably what anand would call as a self help part of the book but we also have a section on how the macro digital good should could be designed in a way there is more competition and this requires the government and the state to lay the guard rails or lay the digital rails and that is more a collective approach that we talk about and that's and we have seen that this is not a theory you know we are doing that in india with all these things at at scale i mean uh, you know npci has built such a platform that does 4.5 billion transactions a month worth over 100 billion dollars I and mean, that's that's real stuff real money and that has dramatically democratized payments for uh, you know few hundred million people so that is also there but i think there's a larger point which you are bringing is that we are this digital thing is creating a two or three different kinds of inequality right one is obviously the digital divide i mean let's take education obviously the child which has an access to a smartphone or whose parent has a smartphone is and and it's all gone to online learning that child has a bigger advantage over a poor family that doesn't have a device so there's a whole so the more you <coughs> rely on technology the more people who are left out of technology will be left behind so that's clearly something and you know we had two years of children not going to school so clearly that's that's one kind of it the second thing is the divide between the people who are jobs that they can do digitally and those who are proximity jobs so if you are in the travel and tourism and hospitality business the last two years has been absolutely extremely difficult because there are no jobs there are no incomes nobody comes to you with a pandemic but if you are a digital job if you are a you know id person or even a you know some guy who writes editorials as opposed to the journalist who has to go in the field the guy who sits in the office and writes editorials these these jobs have thrived because you don't have to go anywhere you can do everything digitally so i think there's the other divide which is those who can do digital remote jobs and those who have proximity jobs and i think then the third thing is happening in 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 the biology kind of thing and increasingly a lot of you know biotech and genomics and all is creating health uh, you know personalized health but that again will be available only to a few because that's going to be for the elite so i think that whether it's health or whether it's uh, jobs or whether it's access to learning i think absolutely i think this whole situation has in many ways become complicated and inequal un- unequal nandan if word 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 just one thing you know nandan you know absolutely i think the some of the things which you said which have happened in india like you know after aadhar was in place uh, the government did put in place that jam trinity which you know arvind subramanian talked about you know the jam dhan aadhar and mobile uh, trinity empowering each other and linking uh, each other through uh, with the government kind of directly putting money in the hands of people uh, through dbts instead of subsidies uh, but you know in a in a low trust uh, democracy like ours at a time say when the pandemic struck and millions moved between cities uh there was this jam trinity network already in place but you know when we go back to the, when we did at that point of time and we were reporting and we went back to the government about identify about you know say why isn't say finance why is that no financial support for people who have lost jobs or lost incomes at that point of time the strange answer that came to us was that you know they couldn't identify ben- beneficiaries whom should this money go to so with when such a once in a 100 year pandemic happens when people are in distress and they are moving out for many reasons could be fear could be job loss income loss and the state is unable to kind of support them despite having put in place a great infrastructure like uh, like a jam what 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 is the take away from that you know do i need that is the question that you know that set of people would ask you no no first of all i think uh, the jam infrastructure was extremely extremely critical and useful during the pandemic uh, you know government uh, spent thousands of crores and 
millions and millions of people got money into their bank account electronically in real time and that was a huge help for vulnerable people farmers and so on so i think it worked very well so one identification is just you who you know that you know anand is anand that's one that's the what aadhar does but that anand is a person who has lost his job and should get money is a different level of it's identifying that he is he should be a beneficiary and that's a separate process but i think we are very fortunate i mean today if you look at you know the aadhar system has called something called aadhar enabled payment system which allows a person in a village to withdraw money from a pc just using his fingerprint biometric that does 90 million transactions a month worth thousands of crores so you know, actually on the ground these systems are actually making a big difference to the lives of the common man you know uh, you, you you mentioned web 3.0 in 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 the last couple of minutes uh, the web 3.0 came up a couple of times uh, and we spoke about you know decentralization in, with crypto especially but the idea of concentration of power i think that question was relevant you know in web 2.0 and web 1.0 and it's even seeming relevant in web 3.0 um it, you know the internet was always promised to be a very democratic medium now of course the payments in india is one beautiful you know global example of where uh, you know government has intervened to ensure that that kind of happens um but do you believe that we are heading you know to this democratic promise of a medium like the internet or do you believe that constitutional power is still something which we have a lot more work to do yeah no i look i think what happens is whenever you have technology uh, there will be some actors who will want to create you know uh, some systems for example if you look at what's happening in the digital in the in the crypto world yeah you know for example uh, to buy and sell crypto finally you have to go to an exchange Yes. and across the world there are you know global exchanges there are three or four of them yes. so in that sense these guys are very you know very important because a lot of the trading goes through them or if you look at the miners who you know who mine these uh, bitcoins and all that they just a very few of them so again if there is concentration of miners or even ownership i mean uh, you know most of the early bitcoin only a few people own most of the bitcoin so if they buy and sell then it moves the currency so you know inevitably this aggregation is happening so there's no perfect uh, solution to any of this we have to try it. and it's a very delicate balance you know because where do governments intervene where do governments intervene what are the rails that government builds what are the innovation that they allow the private guys to build how do you make sure that you know there's no market dominance these are all very complex things and in, in upi i think india rbi government of india npc have done a terrific job in creating that balance yes. where there's extreme competition many many applications but it's all innovation led i can switch my app in one second i can switch my bank account in one second but you know you can't you have to do this in everything and that's that's where the comp- thing comes i mean i i don't know aware of what's happening in this ondc which yes. is essentially uh, an attempt and again it's a group the commerce ministry the commerce minister the secretary technology people the bank everybody come together how do we create an open network for commerce which allows every retailer to participate and offer his product it allows every brand to offer the product to any consumer so in some sense why india is in my view at the cutting edge of many of these things is we are trying to think collectively government market forces technologies everyone how do we create digital infrastructure which allows everyone to participate is inclusive which allows everyone to compete and that's why i think in the next 10 years we're going to see a lot of very exciting things happening on that front no but just short answer are you are you seeing that concentration of power is just as big an issue as it always was in the internet even at even with oh, the but no it, it, has to become better No, it it is. I mean, there's no such thing as perfect decentralization, which is all complete. better or worse. No, I think each of these brings in new <coughs> innovations, and it's entirely possible that this, while this new model may have some centralization, it may still have multiple, uh, you know, multiple. I mean, there's like thirteen thousand different kinds of tokens now, so it's yeah. possible that there'll be more variety and more innovation. And you know, there are exchanges who have their own currency. i mean like isn't that for instance something which is extremely so is government going to regulate do you expect government to step in for fixing 
those kind of but, you know this is an issue in general right i mean is the does the guy who own the rails also provide product on the rails because then he has an advantage and that's one of the arguments for example if you look at some of the laws being considered in europe and in us exactly. the digital yeah. markets act and so on they they're saying that if you run a platform then you cannot bias the platform for your products it's yes. called self preferencing yes. and the same thing applies to crypto because if i'm running a crypto exchange and i'm in the currency business then i should not self preference my exchange to my currency so, but you know we have to at least the point where people are even regulating these guys so, you know we have to first they not as many of them are outside the system some of them don't even have headquarters so yeah, i think yeah. we are somewhere somewhere away from governments taking stock of this and the relationship between the innovators in spaces like crypto and the and the platforms that control the internet uh and governments uh, around the world right whether it is in china whether it is in america whether it is in india that relationship seems uh, seems very interesting i mean if you just focus on the technology on the tech giants uh you know at one point all the biggest billionaires in the world you know they were they had a certain uh, they were very um you know they, they they were kind of very they would bow their head to government but all the new billionaires seem to be kind of government is kind of bowing their heads to them um in a sense so you know how how is the relationship you find evolving between government and these tech giants these tech billionaires in in the in the US and China and comparatively in India no no i think it varies from country to country clearly in china uh, after many years of uh, sort of light regulation and allowing huge companies to come up now there's you can see that they're trying to uh, you know bring in some kind of uh, measures to regulate them yeah. uh, we have seen uh, that uh, china actually banned uh, crypto they don't allow crypto currencies at all Uh, US has a more of a light touch role, but increasingly they're beginning to realize that uh, they need to do something, especially uh, with the category of cryptocurrencies called stable coins. Yes. Because stable coins are like uh, digital dollars, which you can convert to real dollars. And one of the concerns is if a stable coin doesn't have adequate reserves, like a bank doesn't have adequate deposits, and there's a run on that stable coin, then you know there's not enough. real money to convert back and so there are concerns about how stable coins should be regulated there are concerns about if these exchanges do lending then they should come under the same regulations of lending and so on so that's the us view uh europe of course it varies from country to country in india of course i think there are broadly two views one is uh ban all this stuff and that you know these things should exist the other is don't think of crypto as uh, currencies but think of them as commodities that you can buy and sell and if so then obviously the government would like to take a share of the tax of any profits made on that right 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 um and you know one of the things that we, again we see that's quite different is you know how the you know tech giants you know they they always they're quite happy to take positions in uh, london especially in america right you've had uh, you've had uh, bezos you've got sundar pichai that took you know very strong political positions twitter ceo famously keeps taking positions um in india not so much in in uh, by whom by tech giants or by by people like you i mean you know by 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 people who have created so much of value without any government uh, uh support necessarily um you know they just seem much more vocal they seem much more critical is that a fair statement to make well I, i think you know uh, uh, certainly my my view is that if if there's something we have to say we should say it uh, you know behind closed doors or be quiet about it because i don't see any value in just going public about something if you don't agree with something and i i have found that whenever i have uh, especially on matters of technology and other areas where i have some expertise i have found the system has been extremely welcoming of anything because they know that you know i'm coming with the right spirit of how to make the country better right 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 and also if i if i may just push the envelope on this uh, say for instance you have been uh, you have kind of tried you have straddled the pub, public space you fought elections uh, of course you have talked about it as a as an experience which you kind of you also learned many things uh, after your defeat in the elections uh, 
say when things happen in and around you, uh, a young woman, uh, a climate activist being picked up and arrested, or say young women going to colleges wearing a hijab, uh, being heckled, or you know, state government coming out with orders. Uh, do you think that when you weigh in, given the respect that you have uh, in India amongst and being seen, you are, you are also emblematic of a generation which kind of really uh, came up and became, you, you became the poster boy of India. Uh, when you weigh in on an issue, it would be taken much more seriously. No, I think, you know, see, first of all, I know, I think of myself as somebody who likes to solve problems, somebody who can make a difference. But I like to make a difference through action. Uh, I like a difference to uh, make a difference to, uh, you know, maybe convincing people uh, about it. But it's not clear to me that just taking a public position is, is, is necessarily the way to go because then it becomes, then it goes into a different territory. Because, we, you know, I'm not an activist, I'm a problem solver. And I want to use my capital to solve problems. Yeah. The other thing, Nandan, was you know this you know Infosys, of course, delivered to uh, was very closely involved with the government in delivering two big projects like you know, the GST and, and the uh, IT portal. And in both of these uh, big projects, there are, there have been issues, uh, of course, in, in say you know in invoice matching in uh, GST, or say you know uh, e even in the IT portals. It went to the extent of almost the prime uh, of the finance minister summoning the CEO in you know using words like that. Uh, of course, there has been the other end, like when we talk to government also that you know there is some acknowledgement that you know load testing, which is kind of part of the government's job, was not really done well or you know things like that. But say when a magazine which is uh, related to uh, the ruling party in some manner linked to the ruling party says that you know it is a uh, Infosys is anti-national and likens it to likens it to Tukre Tukre gang or urban naxals at that point of time wouldn't Infosys want to speak up well you know I think we, we live in a very uh, vibrant system with a lot of views and I think the what companies have to do and what individuals have to do is, you know, separate the noise from the signals and focus on, on doing the right things. I think in both these projects, I think ultimately things have worked out very well. So, you know, there is a time period when, when things can be stressed because a lot of complexity you're trying to pack in a very short time, but ultimately all these things have come out very well. And I think that's the nature of the beast. We have to go with it. And I think you know, look, businesses can't get into, we are not journalists getting into editorial opinions and so on. We have to run our business. Uh, we have to, you know, meet obligations to society and we have to satisfy our customers. Uh, just on a, on a lighter note, uh, is it, is it um, do you enjoy working with government more or with, uh, or with private uh, customers more when you're doing software? Well, I mean, I, I actually I enjoy the government more when I'm in the government because then I'm actually getting things done. Uh, and no, as a customer, if you're side, of course, I, you know, I enjoy working with both governments and the private sector. I, I see each as a different. I mean, I have the advantage that having worked on both sides, I understand how people think, and that actually gives me a sort of more nuanced understanding of why things are happening the way they are. And I don't know, I've, I've learned now how to deal with it, and I. You know, look, the whole idea of my book is keep calm, right? So I'm calm. No, no, but I'm, but you know, the private sector, if, 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 if they complain, Infosys can push back and say, Hey, you got to look inwards. Uh, but if, if no, no, I think any, a customer is a customer. And I think if somebody has an issue, we have to deal with it, whether it's private or government. I think we as suppliers have to satisfy our customers. That, that's not negotiable, whether it's government or private, Indian or global, it's the same. Sure. Okay, we got a really solid room here. And I've got two more questions I want to kind of go through before we open up to the audience. Um, I think the first the one question that's on everybody's mind, Nandan, and your view, you know, on the the, I, the valuations that we're seeing today, I'm, I'm sure you've been asked this many times, but you know, I still want to ask you, 
is this sustainable? I mean, just broad question, but is this I, are you talking about the new tech companies? All the new tech companies, the unicorns, the sunicorns, the triple unicorns, you know, is this, is this, you know, what is happening? And, you know, uh, and, and, right. and also how did, how do I, how do people like us deal with the FOMO? <laughs> well, uh, you know, don't have FOMO. That's the best way to deal with it. <laughs> But I think, look, we, we, we are obviously already seeing some value compression. I think as the U.S. moves from an uh, era of high, very heavy liquidity at low interest rate yeah. to less liquidity and interest rates going up and people are expecting it now to go up quite quickly starting next month, I think there is value compression going to happen because people are now, the discounting, future value discounting will be less. And so we're seeing some of that. But also, you know, uh, you know, as they say, you know, the stock market in the short term is a voting machine, but in the long term is a weighing machine. So in the short term, people will follow, you know, some exciting new development and have great hopes for it. But in the long term, they look at business performance, revenue, profits, cash flow, earnings, and so on. So I think we are going to see as the markets become tighter on interest rates and liquidity, I think you will see more of the weighing machine dimensions coming in. Yeah. And then, of course, companies that are able to demonstrate they have a path to profitability and are actually generating free cash flow will, will do better. Yeah. No, so would you, uh, would you encourage the re-rating, the broad rating of tech stocks that are happening globally? Do you think it's a... I mean, I mean who am I to tell the market what they should do? But all I'm saying is that when... When liquidity is being will be ultimately reduced in the system because they'll stop buying bonds and so on, and when interest rates start going up because of inflationary pressures, yes, it will have an impact on value because the, some of these values are based on assuming that the interest rates are zero and you know there's going to be ample liquidity. So when the base conditions change, then obviously valuations will get compressed. No? Yeah. And in the Indian context, you know, I mean, we saw what's happening with Bharat Pay specifically, but I'm sure there are other examples of startups where so much money so fast, uh, you know, very difficult for even a big four to maintain, to audit and to check, to find leakages. You know, if you're spending, you know, 40, uh, $100 million in a year, uh, you know, it's tough to catch five, six, $7 million getting leaked. Is this, um, is there anything that you think we should be encouraging to kind of... Uh, Look, I, I, I don't know the specifics of this case, but, you know, I think the fact that, you know, companies have not always stuck to the straight and narrow path has, is, a, is not limited to tech companies. I mean, so, I think, right? so I think, you know, we have to have strong regulations, transparency and uh, enforcement of rule and so on. So I don't think it's particularly a tech phenomenon. I think it's a broader societal thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my last question before we go to the audience, Vaidhi, uh, I think there are a lot of audience questions coming in, but how closely, Nandan, are you watching the tension between US, Russia, China, you know, this whole semiconductor play in Taiwan, you know, all of this, how does this play out for the tech world? How does this play out for India? Just your view on the whole thing. No, I, I think uh, it, is, it is fascinating to see what's happening. And I think, uh, uh, as you rightly said, the semiconductor industry is at the heart of this. And the reason is that uh, over the years, uh, most of these semiconductor, I mean, there was a time when US was a very big semiconductor producer. Yeah. But over the years, in the last 10 years, with the, you know, with the splitting of the design from the foundries where things are made, yeah. so-called fabulous companies, uh, we have seen the massive growth in semiconductor manufacturing, for example, in Taiwan. Taiwan. And just one company in Taiwan, the TSMC, is now becoming it's a rock star in that industry. And they, in fact, they do the bulk of the you know three nanometer kind of chips or five nanometer chips. So what has happened, therefore, is that as these uh, global tensions have gone up, everybody is realizing that this globalized supply chain, where they depend on some guy in Taiwan or somewhere else, is not working. Which is why you see a big push in the U.S. To have more dem uh, domestic semiconductor manufacturing in uh, you know, Ohio recently, Intel announced the plant. Uh, Arizona, there's work going, putting in caps. So I think the consequence of these global uh, global tensions is realizing that these supply chains are actually fragile, and they have to do more to have less dependence on some other countries. So I think it's very fascinating to see how this will play out. I think. Uh, uh, today, the bulk of chip manufacturing is in Taiwan with TSMC and Samsung yep. in Korea, 
even the china production by the way is not all that much yeah so i think uh, how this plays out i think that actually the general thing right how do supply chains get affected in a world of a global tension between countries how do we increase the resilience how do we go from just in time supply chains to just in case supply chains right. so i think there's a lot of rewiring happening in supply chains and the semiconductors is just a, a great example of what's going on and what about with lithium ion so that's again i mean you know this is a, again a broader issue if we when we go to a massive renewable world yes the the metals of that world are different from the metals of the old world i mean in the old world we were look for oil and gas and so on in this world we look for lithium and cobalt and uh, you know nickel uh, uh, you know nickel yeah. and all that copper and so on so the now lithium is interesting because lithium actually very large deposits are in south america you know they are in chile uh, bolivia and uh, uh, you know places like that yeah. but the actual processing of lithium is all in china so if 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 we are going to go to a ev world with lithium ion batteries then that has to be fixed too so it's actually fascinating this one is this global tension and then you overlay the transformation to a zero net zero world all of it coming together you know map all these things to figure out what's happening and it's all very interdependent you can't do it isolation from other countries it has to be done together so that's the that's the trick yeah, yeah 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 Let's go to some audience questions. Why are we getting some? Yeah, uh, we have. Kumar? Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Why do you want? Yeah, uh, we have Tushar Kumar, Argasia Education Private Limited. Hi, hi, sir. This is Tushar. Basically, I wanted to ask, like, technology is enhancing, and day by day. And uh, human brain I means is technology uh, facilitating human brain to evolve uh, for humans to evolve further, or it's actually paralyzing human brain for its evolution. No, that's a great question, and in fact, that's a big part of what we do in the book. We're saying that if you just use it in an unrestricted way, you'll actually end up with being pulled in so many different directions. and therefore you have to consciously put in systems on the way you use technology and that's a one time activity it's not every day you put up those systems and then you work within those systems you can have a much better and much more positive equation with your technology in fact that's exactly what's there in the book art of bitfulness that tanuj bhojwani and i have written vishal sagal hi vishal from nischay educop vishal is md of the channel yeah i'm trying to unmute uh, so uh, nandan you spoke about the digital tech goods and the public platform and that being an important uh, thing going forward uh, do they and i believe they offer an opportunity for india and india companies to take these technologies to third world you know a, a, a new set of countries like up uh, upi or ondc or the health platform but do you think the government should also get into it Uh, through something like an exim bank or whatever else to create the tech soft power for india uh, in these uh, in these uh, countries where uh, these systems would be of use oh absolutely and i think the government is getting it right i'll give you three things that have happened in recently one is just the announcement this week that npci is launching upi in nepal that's clearly an example of an export of a technology built here into nepal or a couple of weeks back there was an announcement that Sri Lanka was going to build an Aadhaar-like system, and the government of India and the government of Sri Lanka signed an agreement. Or if you look at the digital vaccination certificate that India has, which is part of the COVID platform, the underlying technology of that, which is called DeWalk, an open source platform, is being is being used in Sri Lanka, Philippines, uh, and many other countries. So you're already seeing. that indian uh, digital technology built as public goods is going out and the government is is playing a role in that because they also want this to go out they are trying they are offering the covid package to com- companies countries that want to implement vaccination platform so i think you are definitely seeing uh, what you just said which is india and in the indian government promoting indian digital public goods globally yeah uh you have mr dharmakriti joshi also mr joshi yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, mr vedanathan uh, 
So, Mr. Nilkeni, I think I really enjoyed your talk. And my basic question is, I think one is the difficulty with becoming aware that we are falling prey to the technology. I think it's it's easier said than done. I think, and without awareness, uh, the, the the course correction is very difficult. But the the sec the second part to this question is that uh, uh, maybe I think following. I've not read your book as yet, but. Uh, I did buy it on Kindle today, and I hope to read it uh, in, in the next few few days. But I think there is another side to this whole story. It's often argued that uh, that technology firms and apps, uh, etc., they're collecting a lot of information, which you also alluded to it, and which can be used to manipulate your behavior. So in that case, it becomes very difficult for people to wean themselves off uh, of the platform or technology. Uh, and I think this is what uh, uh, what you are Harari. Calls hacking the brain, so to say. So, do you think that firms need to be regulated for the welfare of the society in general, uh, or do you think that uh, people have to be discerning enough uh, uh, to not to fall prey? Uh, I think it's both, uh, Mijoshi. I think uh, obviously people have to be discerning enough. It is because of the business model which originally came, because there was no commerce possible. You couldn't buy things, or there was no payments on the internet. The only business model that emerged was advertising. And advertising was directly linked to how much you were able to engage a person to see things. And that's why this whole attention economy has come about. So obviously we have to do it. And of course, around the world, governments, I think, are much more serious of this matter. If you look at the spate of proposals in US and in Europe, uh, they are trying to see how to create uh, different kinds of laws and regulations to also uh, you know, bring some, some moderation here. So it's both on the individual and on society to deal with this. Can we get uh, Jayanta Goshal, a consulting editor with India today? Thank you very yeah. much, sir. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Nilakani. I read your book and uh, it is fascinating. I mesmerized. My question is very simple that you have, although you have said that you are not problem solver, you are not activist. There was a gossip that you may join politics, but later you didn't. But you know, there is a chapter that how to be together. You know, this book I read, maybe 225 pages or like that. But I, my feeling, subject to correction, that it is, you have handled it with more with individual. Although there is a chapter of the how to be together, but what actually we are discussing that when the social media, the minions and the uh, I mean, the fake news, post-truth, how to handle as a community. Although you have mentioned a uh, few things in this chapter that how to handle the uh, social media, uh, networks, data, everything. But you know, the social consciousness, how to rebuild without building a movement or uh, we are not activists. True. You are not journalists also. But what can be the solution? I'm a little confused. I'm happy that this book, although I, have, I don't think it's a self-help book, rather it's a more philosophy of life in digital age. It is my definition what, as a reader. But you know, a lot of books are either of. Either uh, the, it is good, or I, I was reading a book recently before your book, The Dark Social, Understanding the Darker Side of Our Personality and Social Media. It's a very negative. But you have made a balance, like a work-life balance also. But what can be the solution I, to uh, combat the fake riot in the social media and our privacy, sense of privacy, how to protect? I'm a little confused if you can dispel my oh, darkness see, of are, this mind, actually. Yeah, there are no I easy guess. solutions. Uh, and, you know, we, we are trying with this book to, as you said, come out with a philosophy of how to operate in this intense digital world. Uh, and we have tried to capture both what is, what is it that individuals can do and what societies can do. And you, know, you can't get everything uh, right. But I think we also try to bring awareness to the fact that this is a big thing in front of us and all of us have to start thinking about it. Just as we worry about the pandemic or we worry about climate change, we also have to worry about how do we create a stable interface for all of us with our technology. Uh, we got two questions in the box. I think I'll try, quickly try them and then uh, Nandan, I've got a short rapid fire for you, which I want you to have some fun with. Uh, Sharad Somani, uh, KPMG. Sharad, are you there? Can you turn your mic on and ask the question? Uh, 
Okay, I'll just read it out. Uh, what's the future of work with Sweden going four days work week and working from home becoming a norm? Do you see our life moving into meta virtual world totally? How does future generation cope with this drastic societal change? Well, I think there are a couple of dimensions to the future of work. One is where do you do the work, and I think that's where the question is: Do you do work in the office? Do you do work at home? Do you do partly from home, partly for office? Is it a hybrid model? I think that's one of the big issues that uh, people are facing, and we don't really know the answers. We don't know what is going to be the steady state nature of this work in the coming. And it's fascinating; different companies are, are grappling with this, and uh, so I think that that equilibrium will only come post the pandemic. And different companies may have different equilibrium. Some may have a third of the people in the office. Some may have nobody in the office. So that's all up for grabs. The second related part is this metaverse stuff. So what basically the argument is that if you're going to be working more and more remotely, how does the technology make it a much more immersive experience? So, like for example, if six five of you are in a room, how do you create a, a, a way I can see the guy to my left, I can talk to the guy on my right, and some of them may be physically in the room, some of them may just be avatars. So, how do you create a more immersive experience to make collaboration easier? And that's at least where the metaverse in the business world is going towards. So it's a the related, but uh, it's all part of the fact that increasingly work will be done distributed. Some of it physically in the same room, some of it with people far away in their homes or other countries. Uh, have you got a pair of Oculus? Are you are you on the metaverse? You plan on being? You aren't on WhatsApp, so I'm not sure. No, no, I'm not on metaverse. You're not on metaverse. Okay, cool. Oh. <laughs> That's what we thought. Why um, do I think we'll just go to the rapid fire? Yeah, let's go there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then just as a quick. Q and A. So your first answer comes to your mind. Your most millennial habit. Most millennial habit. I mean, now I don't think what do millennials do to know what's what's the <laughs> habit. Uh, you binge watch. Do yeah, you, yeah, I binge watch. Yes. watch. No, no, I binge watch. I, especially in the pandemic, I did a lot of binge watching. I think I was sure. I have, I think, all the streaming channels, and I watch all of them and binge watch for sure. Yeah, I know that streaming, but it's a millennial habit. But I do have this habit. What's the last show you binge watched? Right now, I'm watching a show called Inventing Anna on Netflix. So what uh, interesting! My wife and I started it just last week, and we took thirty minutes to decide which show to start. You know, so that part of your book talks about the problem of having. It does. It does. Yeah. <laughs> tyranny of choice. Tyranny of choice. Um, a business leader you admire? Well, I think uh, I admire uh, leaders globally. Of course, people like uh, Bill Gates, and in India, of course, uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Mr. Ratan Tata, Mr. Azim Prem Ji are all phenomenal business leaders. And of course, my good friend who passed away, Rahul Bajaj, he was an amazing person. I really, he was a terrific guy. He was, and he was very, very generous to me. So he is one I really deeply admire. The one milestone in your life that you feel most proud of? I think the uh, fact that I was able to keep my promise when I went to government, delivered Aadhaar, and came back. And now I think the fact that in the last four years I've been at Infosys, and you know, it's become a much better situation. Wonderful. Um, Google or Facebook, the lesser evil? I know. I think both are. Amazing companies, and uh, I, I think what I like about Google is the products are very useful. In the sense, you know, uh, Google, I, you know, you, you to do search, you need Google. To use your Android phone, you need Google. So I think it's a phenomenal company. Okay, so you, so, so you are you? Is there any is there any Silicon Valley giant that you think needs uh, some serious introspection? Well, I think let me stay out of that one because uh, <laughs> okay. they're all friends of mine. Okay. Um, China or America, which country will end up leading the world in electric vehicles? In what? In EVs, electric vehicles. In the short term, clearly China, because China has invested hugely in electric vehicles and you know all LTP batteries, amazing stuff happening in China. But you can never discount innovation in the U.S. And what we have found is you cannot. Once they make up their mind and they unleash the innovators, they do amazing things. Think. You see what's happened with Tesla, the new Ford Explorer from Ford, GM's Cruise. You see some very exciting things happen in the U.S. So it's entirely possible that they'll catch up dramatically. Um, the usage of the Aadhaar 
BJP or Congress? Who who use Aadhaar better? I, I think the Congress gave me the freedom and space to build it, which I'm I'll always be grateful for that. And the BJP applied it in the most efficient and effective way. Okay. And China or US? Which country will end up leading the world in technology? I still think it will be the U.S. because you know finally innovation requires much more freedom and and you know people being able to do companies and the U.S. is unbeatable in that. The one uh, government service that you wish Infosys did. <laughs> well, you know I I think we are very grateful for the opportunity to build. the entire indirect and direct tax system of india and you know we just want to make that better and better wonderful and then thank you so much for your time really you know it's just such a pleasure talking to you always it's always so thought provoking and this book is just proof that thank you so much uh, anand and uh, never never never, and... ne- never have enough conversation with anand nilekani thank, thank you, you so much, much nandan very grateful to you guys thanks thanks to thank all of you at so indian express thanks thanks puja take care okay bye bye thank you Bye. Thanks for everything. Thanks. Pooja, you want to do closing note? Yeah, that was that was a great conversation. Thanks, Anand. Thanks, Vadhi, and thanks, Mr. Nilekani, for joining us. Um, and also one final thanks to our presenting partner, Finolex Pipes, our associate partners, MDH, uh, EO Mumbai, the Hindu Zone dot com, and M- MIDC. Uh, and also many thanks once again to our live webcast partner, Twenty Four Frames Digital. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.